Frederica and I are going to talk a little bit about the many author not research paper, and we're going to share some survival strategies for how to navigate the process of writing one of these and getting it published, both as an organizer or a writing lead and also as a co-author. So uh, these are just some examples of some of the papers that myself or Frederica and I have been involved with. Um, so one example is recommendations for empowering early career researchers to improve research culture and practice. And this was done with a very large group of researchers from 24 countries, I believe, um, 54 authors. And it's it was quite a task to get everyone from around the globe involved in this. Um, we did another one, which was looking at 10 simple strategies for implementing open and reproducible research practices after attending a training course. And the writing lead here was Verena Heise. And this was done by a group of early career researchers who had attended one of the two major reproducibility courses that Quest is involved with over the past two to three years prior to the manuscript being written. Then we have another one that looks at 11 strategies for making re reproducible research and open science practices the norm at research institutions. And this was done in collaboration with the German Reproducibility Network and included people from many different institutions around Germany. And another one I've worked on and something out of the European Commission um, started by the Joint Research Center, which is a set of guidelines for promoting reusable and open methods and protocols, recommendations to improve methodological clarity in the life sciences. So all of these are not research publications, they are guidelines or other large pieces that give a very thorough overview of many different topics. So today I'm going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of working on a many author, not research paper. I'll tell you a little bit about the process we use. I'll share some survival strategies for how to navigate that process successfully and efficiently as an organizer. And then Frederica will give you some tips for how to navigate this process efficiently if you are a co-author on a many author, not research paper. So the first question you might be wondering is, why would you do this? Um, and that's an excellent question. I would say one of the biggest advantages is that you get more comprehensive and nuanced content. If you bring together a very diverse group of people with many different experiences and expertise, your manuscripts benefit from that. You get a lot more information um, and you're able to put things together in a way that other groups perhaps have not been able to previously. Because you have many people from different experiences as part of your writing team, you end up with papers that resonate with many different audiences instead of being narrowly focused, and that can lead to broader dissemination. And when you're disseminating, instead of you and your research group disseminating your paper, you have all of this different, all of these different author co coalitions, <clears throat> as well as the networks that each of your authors bring that the paper is being shared with, which can lead to much broader impact. It's also a good opportunity for network building, and so we have seen people developing relationships and collaborations out of the events that we run, beyond simply the paper that we complete as a group at the end, and it's still to be determined is whether all of these things, while they lead to better papers, whether that in fact translates into greater impact. Disadvantages are the time investments, especially for leads and organizers of this process. These are not fast papers to write. So if you're looking for something quick to put it on your CV, this is not the place to find it. And the logistics can also be very complex. And Frederica and I will talk more about the details of that in a moment. So in terms of the process, there are essentially five steps that we go through. We start off with generating content. We do this through a virtual brainstorming event. There are other ways of doing it. Um, whatever way you use, you want to make sure that you're bringing together a lot of people who wouldn't normally talk to each other so that your content will be unique compared to what's already out there in the literature. The next thing you need to do once you've had your content generation event is to plan your output. So you'll need to define your key messages and the structure of your paper, and then you need to prepare the output. We do this in three phases. So we'll start with an outline, and then we'll ask the organizing team to give feedback and we revise, and then we ask all of the co-authors to give feedback and revise. 
We then do a first draft and we go through the same process of asking the organizing team to provide feedback and revising and asking all co-authors to give feedback and then revising. And then we'll do the same thing with a second draft. And usually by the time you're through the second draft, it's quite close to being ready to submit. Then you have the manuscript submission process and that proceeds as normal until the manuscript is accepted for publication. So I mentioned that there are many ways to generate content and the one that we use is the virtual brainstorming event. Um, I have provided a QR code that links out to a paper describing how we run these events. Three of the four papers that you saw on the first slide were done through these virtual brainstorming events. And so these combine a variety of things. They are designed to be asynchronous so that people around the world can participate, add to the conversation and expand the discussion at times that are convenient for them. So we'll have two one hour networking events where participants talk to each other in breakout rooms in small groups to get to know who else is participating. Throughout the event, we have online discussions going on on Slack, and these are very active. It is 30 conversations happening at the same time, and people can participate in as many or as few of those conversations as they like, because it's all written, it's archived, and everyone can add at times that are convenient for them. We then offer a couple of webinars where we have lightning talks or Pecha Kucha talks. These are short showcases of content that is relevant to the topic of discussion. And then we'll have open spaces. And these are moderated small group discussions on pre-selected topics that are hosted by the organizing team. Choosing a topic. So when we get through the virtual brainstorming event, we usually have enough content that we could write five or 10 papers. We don't have time to write five or 10 papers. So we have to select content for one paper that we feel best fills a gap in the literature. So we're looking for things that are unique, that aren't already addressed by other papers or resources or materials. And once you've decided on your focus, you want to pick a structure that will best convey your message. Here's some examples of things that we've done in the past. So recommendations or guidelines, the recommendations for empowering early career researchers to improve research culture and practice, as well as the ProMap guidelines would both fit into this recommendation and guideline space. We've also done 10 simple rules papers. So the 10 simple rules for implementing open and reproducible research practices after attending a training course, we felt the best way to convey the content we wanted there was by offering others 10 simple rules. And then the last strategy we've used is the catalog of ideas. And so here we had a lot of people at different institutions who were implementing all different strategies to make reproducible research and open science training the norm at research institutions. And so we felt that a catalog of ideas was the best way of showcasing lots of different strategies to get people thinking beyond just offering a training course and to start thinking about how we can involve people in many different roles, in administrative roles, teaching roles, technical roles, research roles, um, sitting on committees, all of these people, what could they do and how could they be involved? So how is the process of doing a many author paper different from the process of writing a paper with a few co-authors? Well, if you're working on a paper with a few co-authors, then you'll start off by drafting a paper. You'll get feedback from others in your small team, and likely those are all people who you know well, who are part of your research group or closely connected research groups. You're then going to revise your paper and submit it through public for publication through the normal process. In a paper with many co-authors, the process looks a little bit different. It starts out the same in that you draft and outline the paper, and you get feedback from the writing team, and then you revise and share it with co-authors. And here's where things start to look different, because at the point where you share that paper that you normally would have just submitted with your co-authors, you now have 30 to 50 plus highly engaged people who are going through everything and telling you in detail everything that they dislike or think could be improved about the paper. And also, these very passionate individuals don't always agree. And so the challenge for you is to build consensus and to find a path forward that leads to the best paper that you can write. So the first thing that you want to accept when you start working on a many author paper as you're leading that paper is that you will not be able to make everyone happy and your life will be much easier if you just acknowledge and accept this before you start. 
I have a very different relationship from the on the with the many author papers that I worked on from the way that I feel about the papers that are out of my research group or few author papers. With the many author papers, I can tell you everything that people like or don't like about the structure of the paper, the content of the paper, that people would like to be different. I always know which co-authors were really passionately disagreeing with certain points and what things we were able to resolve and what things we weren't able to resolve. And so those papers in my mind, I have, I have it, the many author process really dissuades you of the notion that your paper is perfect. Um, you, you go into these papers at the time you submit them with a very extensive catalog of everything that people won't like or will find difficult about it, as well as everything that people like. And that's a very different relationship to have with your paper. You're going to need some skills. The first one is skills for building consensus. So conflict resolution, getting people to um, work together collaboratively to think about a third way of finding solutions and consensus when you have two opposing parties. All of these skills are really important, as well as de-escalating when there's conflict or disagreement among your authors. Communication is really important, and communication happens on two levels. One is how you're communicating the findings in the paper itself and the information you want to convey. And then the second is communication amongst the authorship team. You're going to get a lot of comments and emails and feedback from all of your authors. They will have questions about things in the process as well as the content, and all of that communication has to be managed. And then the third piece is what Frederica and I started calling defensive writing. And we coined this term because there were lots of times where we were saying, okay, if we write it this way, we know some people will interpret it, it will misinterpret this in the following way. And so we need to say it this way to avoid that misinterpretation. When you have people from many different audiences reading your paper, misinterpretations are more common. And so over time, you start to learn what areas of your content will cause miscommunication for people and how to write defensively to avoid those miscommunications. Okay, there are a number of challenges that you'll encounter. The first one and the biggest one with every paper is structure. The issue here is that this is a not research paper. So if you are writing a paper that follows the introduction methods results discussion format, everyone is very familiar with that. People have written lots of those. They've reviewed lots of those. They really understand well how this format works and how to use it effectively. However, most scientists have fairly limited experience with writing not research papers. And that means that when it comes to thinking about your structure, you're often going to get for poor or conflicting advice from your co-authors, from editors, and from reviewers. There are a couple of mitigation strategies that you can use to address this problem. First thing, the best way to know whether a structure will work is often simply to try it and compare two different versions. It's work, it takes time, but usually there is a clear winner and you can clearly tell the structure is better, this one doesn't work because of this. When you have tried those experiments, you want to be transparent with co-authors, editors, and reviewers about what didn't work and why. So if someone is suggesting, I think we should use this structure instead, you can say, hey, we tried that. This is what didn't work about it. Um, and because of that, we've decided to go with this structure that we've used. The next challenge is the accordion effect. So there's, you write your paper and you write a certain amount of content that you think is enough to publish, but not too much. And then you share it with your co-authors. And what happens is that everyone adds things. They add lots of things, so many things, and no one takes things out ever. And so that means you end up with a very long paper. So I've given you a visual example of how this might look. So you might have the first draft prepared by the organizers where we have five different sections, one after the other. And then you send it out to your co-authors to get feedback. Now, every one of those initial five sections is longer. And also there are three or four or five more sections that you didn't anticipate, which makes the manuscript still longer. And so now it's much longer than it was before. And it's at a length that probably won't be publishable. And so when you revise, you have to shorten the manuscript to make it more concise, more straightforward. And some of those new sections may stay, some of them you may decide don't fit or aren't within the scope. 
And so you're using the feedback to clarify the message of your paper, to improve the structure, and to refine how you allocate space amongst different sections to best communicate your message. So mitigation strategies for the accordion effect, really clearly define the scope and the focus of your paper. Use that to make decisions about what stays in and what gets cut. Reject insertions. Co-authors are often very uncomfortable about taking out something that someone else has added, and so it falls on the organizers to do that if co-authors aren't providing input there. The other thing to remember is that you will get lots of additions on content that is common and that is already out in the literature and that lots of people have experience with. However, it's often the uncommon themes, the uncommon topics, the things that people don't have experience with that are the most novel content. So be cautious about getting a lot of additions in places that are repeating existing content. Really look for what do we have that's new? What do we have that no one else has that would be valuable to share? Remind authors repeatedly about length constraints. So we remind them when we send out emails, we remind them at the top of the draft in large letters highlighted, you know, this is the word count we're at, this is the word count we need to be at to submit to our target journal, we need to cut this many words to help people to think about this and help you with this process of deciding what needs to be there and what doesn't. And we also encourage authors to work on follow-up papers if there are popular topics that are out of scope. So if we're getting a lot of input on a particular section that just doesn't fit within the scope of the paper, we'll encourage people to work together on another paper where they can reuse and share that content and define the scope around sharing that content that they're creating. The next challenge is high volume feedback. Lots of authors means lots of feedback. And some of that feedback is due to a desire to justify authorship. It's due to people's feeling that they need to contribute in a visible way and to show you what they have added. Um, and so Frederica will talk a little bit more about this later. You also have to remember that there will be different channels for feedback. So there's going to be emails, there's going to be comments on the draft, and there are also people who will email you a separate draft with their comments on it or who will send you essentially their report of their comments. Co-authors are also only going to see comments at the time they review the draft. So if there's a large discussion going on, they might not be aware of how it ended. They might only be aware of the bit that was there at the time that they saw the draft. Mitigation strategies. The first thing you want to do is specify what type of feedback is most useful at each stage. So major points about structure, content, large content, like what's missing, what's there that doesn't need to be, those are most useful early. Whereas copy editing, wording considerations, those things are more useful at later stages of the draft. Um, we've had, for example, people copy editing an outline, not productive at that stage. At the outline stage, we really want feedback on the structure and the overall major points of the content. Encourage people to just plus one things that they agree with. Lots of people are reviewing something. Many of them will have the same comments. It's easier for everyone just to put a plus one and move on instead of writing a whole different comment. If you have feedback that's coming in via email, it can be helpful to have one organizer to enter that feedback on the shared version of the draft that you're working with, with attribution of who the comment came from, and that helps everyone to have access to all of the comments. Don't respond in real time. Let the conversation evolve. Um, quite often, authors will come to a consensus about how to handle a particular point, and it can be helpful for them to see if someone has suggested a change and others are saying, no, I prefer it the way it was before, or people will, people will go through these discussions and sometimes they'll come to consensus without you needing to intervene. And then if there are aggressively critical comments, um, let co-authors handle those. So in every draft we've had, we've had someone who's come in and posted something that is really quite aggressively critical. And in every case within a few hours, one of the other co-authors has come in and said, I don't think this comment is really appropriate and here's why. And that will often be followed by several other people doing the same thing. If you respond, you're putting yourself in a defensive position and you're signaling that you are not open to feedback and you're doing that in a 
as a person who's in a position of power as the person who is organizing the draft. And so some people may be frustrated because they feel you're not open to feedback. Some people may agree with the comment. Other people may feel both. If you let the co-authors handle it for you, you avoid looking defensive and the message of the comment wasn't really appropriate comes through anyway without you having to intervene. So that's always a better approach. Handling divergent or conflicting feedback is always an issue. So there will be cases where people reach consensus. There will be cases where they don't reach consensus. And you will get related comments on the same points or different solutions to the same problem. Um, you want to use the co-author comments as a general indication of which parts of your message aren't clear but comments about the particular solutions may not be as good because people aren't used to writing this type of paper. So focus more on using the comments to figure out what isn't clear, what don't people understand, what doesn't make sense. Don't worry so much about implementing exact solutions in the way suggested by co-authors, reviewers, and editors. There is often a third way that no one has suggested, which allows you to address the underlying problem, but it's a bit different from all the solutions proposed, and that's fine. Passionate individuals. These, um, you will get a lot of feedback, not only from co-authors, but because these papers have broader dissemination, we also tend to get quite a bit of feedback from people outside of the author team when the papers are posted as preprints. So when the content is relevant, interactions with passionate individuals can greatly improve your paper. However, these suggestions can create challenges if the proposed content is out of scope or if it's something that you already know that other co-authors will strongly disagree with. Your mitigation strategies overall is to de-escalate the situation. So um, if we have three different types of passionate individuals that we usually hear from. The first is people who want you to cite my thing. Sometimes that thing is very, very relevant to the paper and it's exactly what you need. And you say, thank you, that's great. And you do cite their thing and mention it. Other times it's not relevant. And if it isn't relevant or it's out of scope, then you just wanna be polite, but firm. Um, and explain, hey, this looks really interesting. Unfortunately, we don't think it, it's a little bit out of scope for the current manuscript, but thank you for sharing it with us. The next thing is very strong opinions. And these are people who have a particularly strong opinion about something in the draft, usually a change that they would like to see. Sometimes these comments are very helpful. Other times they are not really fitting with the scope of the draft or the way you want to move things forward. Or there may be a clear reason why what the person is suggesting just won't work. So in this case, we usually remind the co-author that this is a group writing process and that not everyone is going to be completely happy with everything. And that includes us as the leads. We're never completely happy with everything in the manuscript either. It's a consensus process um, of, of building consensus amongst all our authors to best meet the content the group would like to convey. And what you really want to do in this case is to set boundaries to prevent hostage taking. So you never want to give one author veto power of a draft that it's being written by many people. Sometimes you'll also get repeated requests. And if the person is making the same request over and over, then it's best to offer a clear and direct response and then quietly disengage if the conversation becomes circular and is not making progress or covering new content. Communication. You're going to get a lot of emails and a lot of comments. We have had drafts where we've had 250 comments come in. That's not counting the emails and the, the comments that were sent to us in other ways. That's just the stuff that was directly posted on the draft. In addition to that, you're getting emails from people who want to know how the draft is going, what the timeline is for submission, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of communication and a lot of feedback. Mitigation strategies. We create a new offline copy when we start working on the revision. We don't respond to every comment in the original draft and accept or reject changes because it would just be far too much work and the draft would very quickly become completely unreadable for everyone. So we pull it offline and we work completely separately. 
We take our time in revising. You often need to go through stages of revision where you make major changes and structural changes first, and then you get to the more minor changes, and that stage process just takes time. And we also want to have enough time in between drafts that authors are seeing it with new eyes. So we want them to think about, does this paper work overall, instead of thinking about, did they implement the wording change that I suggested in paragraph three in the fourth sentence? When you send out new versions, you want to explain what major changes were made and why you made those changes. If there were changes that were commonly suggested that you didn't implement, you want to explain why. You want to tell people what types of comments are most helpful at this phase of the draft that you're currently at, and then highlight any constraints like length constraints at the top of the draft. When you're doing revisions, there are three different types of people. Um, when you send out for feedback. There are the people who are going to get your email and immediately go into the draft and start working on it. There are the people that are going to go into the draft right before the deadline and enter their comments. And then every time, no matter how long <laughs> you give people to give feedback, you will always have three to five people who will email you at the deadline to say, I need a few more days. This is always going to happen. So we recommend that you just plan for it. Usually, Two weeks is a good amount of time that allows most people to get their comments into the draft. So you're going to plan for three weeks. You'll tell your authors two weeks to do their comments. And then when those people do come back and say, hey, I need a few more days, <clears throat> you can give them a few more days and still be within your three-week timeline and everyone who wants to gets to provide feedback. Maintaining motivation can be a challenge. Um, when you have a lot of criticism and a lot of comments to address, it can lead to a decline in motivation for organizers. So mitigation strategies, ask authors for feedback at a time you're busy when, when you're busy with other things. So if I know I'm traveling a lot in the next month and I won't have time to look at the draft, that's when I'm gonna send it out to authors for feedback because I won't feel like the feedback process is introducing delays and I won't be in the manuscript all the time checking everything. The staged approach I mentioned on the last slide, so major feedback first with structure and content changes, and then have a separate meeting for the minor comments that still apply once the major visions are complete. There's no point in making a lot of little wording changes to a section if you're just gonna cut that section anyway. You want to meet with the organizing team to decide what feedback is and isn't useful and really focus on the major themes of feedback, the repeating comments as opposed to every individual comment. Want to remember that some of the minor criticism is motivated by a desire to make a visible contribution and Frederica will talk why it's about why it's really important to reframe what contribution to authorship means for these many author papers. Um, and then take your time when revising. It often needs to be a long process, and that's okay. You shouldn't feel rushed. So this is a work in process. It's a process that we are still balancing, and we're figuring out how best to be inclusive, but also to be efficient at the same time. And a lot of the things that we're trying now relate to giving our authors better feedback and instructions about what do we need at this phase of the draft? How can you help us most? Um, we are continuing to work on and improve that process, so please take this as a, a work in progress talk as you're thinking about how to move forward. So I'm now going to turn things over to Frederica, who will share with us some tips for being a co-author on a many author, not research paper. Um, thank you, Tracy. So yeah, exactly. Here I will provide some tips we found, which we found useful for co-authors working on a many authors paper. Yes. Next. <laughs> so first, when working on a many author paper, adapt your understanding of authorship. So being one of many authors probably means that others have already commented on major issues in the draft. And that, so as a tip, show that you agree with a comment already provided by adding a plus one or a thumbs up and then just move on. Don't try to find very minor points to comment on and ju to just make a visible contribution. The rationale behind this is that already the content generation phase, for example, input giving during a virtual brainstorming event is already an intellectual contribution, which justifies co-authorship. So be aware that the writing team or the leads are not going to count comments and input from individual authors to check if they, if they have contributed enough. 
The focus is to identify the major changes that are needed to improve the paper draft, and the high number of very minor points make this much harder for the team. Yes. So engage consistently. The writing process will involve several rounds of feedback, so try to review content at each round, and where possible, do so within the time frame allocated by the organizers. Why is this important? Well, when co-authors miss feedback rounds or stages in the writing process, they may repeat feedback already made by others in earlier rounds, or they might reopen decisions which were already made previously. And by engaging consistently throughout the process, you avoid doing so. Yes. Um, yeah, trying to provide major feedback early as already Tracy showcased and address minor points later. So during the outline and first draft phases, focus primarily on changes related to structure and major content. Especially restructuring occurs commonly and especially during early writing phases. So there's no point in for you to spend time rewording text passages, which might be cut in the end. Especially in the early stages of the process, leads have the most freedom to change and adjust structure and content. And another important tip here is to always consider if information you want to add is important enough to remove something in its stead that is already there. So keep in mind that no publisher wants a 10,000 word manifesto and consider this when adding information. Give clear and complete feedback. So when providing feedback in form of comments, always keep in mind that not everyone has your level of background knowledge. Draft your comments in a way that which makes it easier for the organizers to understand what you mean. If possible, include references, links, and explanations of the examples of feedback you have provided. And this is especially important when the writing team is deciding which input is crucial and should be included in the paper draft. Missing sources, no citable references, or absent explanations of provided feedback make this task much harder for the organizers. Try to be open and keep comments constructive. So when working on many author paper during feedback rounds, keep in mind how your comments or replies to other comments might be perceived by the other co-authors. Co so take some cooling off time before addressing views or aspects you disagree or strongly disagree with. So especially um, consider that not everyone working on the paper will have the same views and opinions as you have, especially with a large author group where there's a great, great diversity of perspectives. So if there's really something that you strongly disagree with, take some time before replying and to be as polite and constructive as possible. So it might happen that you're feeling overwhelmed. So try to focus on specific sections of the paper. So imagine when many co-authors work on a single paper draft, it will lead to a lot of input, feedback, and text edits. And it's such, it's easy to lose track and feel overwhelmed by the sheer amount of input and edits suggested during feedback rounds. So tips we found useful here include that first, um, you read through the full paper draft. This will help you get familiar with the overall content and prevents you from providing duplicated feedback. And then if you're feeling overwhelmed, don't try and provide feedback to the whole draft, but select a section of the draft where your area of, of expertise lies or which is most interesting for you to work on. So then, um, our golden rule is to imagine if everyone or even just 25% of the co-authors would do this. And this rule is important throughout the whole writing process. So when providing examples of references or references, think critically if these are within scope or purely self-promotional. And so this might be a bit difficult, but avoid numerous or, or gratuitous references to your own work and also refrain from adding lengthy sections about your own work unless requested. Of course, it's, um, yeah, it's easy to promote your own work, but it's often um, what something that you want, but keep in mind that there are 20 to 50 other co-authors who would also then do this. And so keep in mind that you're working with a lot of other people on this. 
When providing feedback, do so within the time frame specified by the organizers, and we have highlighted this before, and also avoid sending feedback via email afterwards if possible. Working on a many author paper is a lengthy process, so be patient and limit the number of times contacting the organizers for updates or progress reports. And I already hinted at this, but why is this rule so important? Well, just remember, keep in mind that 20 to 50 or more other co-authors are also providing feedback, are also contacting the organizers, asking for updates or providing more feedback before, during and after each single round of feedback. And this also creates a lot of work for the organizers who might then easily feel overwhelmed by this. Um, coming now to the end of the presentation, we would like to share a short take home message with you. So leading a many author paper or being a co-author on one can be quite challenging. However, it provides a great opportunity to build networks, capture diverse perspectives and share undocumented knowledge. 